Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the show Off the Record. I'm Aram Milkham, the host. Thanks for tuning in. On the show, I'm interviewing well known CEOs and VCs about how to spend the money you raise effectively and what mistakes to avoid. My guests have been in the trenches and have lots of practical advice to share company stories, failures, and successes. As a founder, you'll hear what you can do better when raising money and after you have raised the money, all in a 30-minute conversation. And if you happen to be a VC, you're also in the right spot. You'll get to learn from your peers on the show. So this is episode number 17, and I'm joined here today with uh, Jayesh Parmar, uh, the former CEO and co-founder of Picketic, uh, which was an event management and ticketing platform that was acquired by Eventbrite in 2018. Uh, Jayesh was uh, listed as one of the world's top 10 tech entrepreneurs disrupting the event industry. Uh, as a serial entrepreneur with over two decades of business experience, public speaking, uh, and being featured uh, personality in the star documentary Day Job, he's currently co-founding a direct-to-consumer uh, e-commerce company with his wife. So, uh, Jay, it's awesome to have you. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, pretty impressive in terms of how much information you were able to dig up. <laughs> Hey, we did our we did our due diligence. We definitely, we definitely did. We definitely did. Cool, cool. Well, I'm excited to have you. Um, let's let's just jump into it. I uh, wanted to um, talk about one of the things that we chatted about previously when we connected. Uh, you were sharing a bit about some of your story previously, I think, with Picatick, um, and you were talking about um, something that you were discussing with your lawyer, and he was saying. Mm -hmm. You know, Jay. Uh, you know, you might get sued. So, let's start there. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Okay. So, I mean, kind of bring in the story a little bit is that we were we got a first term sheet uh, from a potential inquirer or the inquirer that was in, in that 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 bought us, which is uh, Eventbrite, fantastic company, by the way. Um, and so when that was coming in during that whole entire process, it's as a first time entrepreneur going through an acquisition of this size and this caliber, uh, mm -hmm. our lawyer, I mean, there's, there's just things that you just don't learn in school. Uh, they, they're not taught to you. It's one of those things where you go through. Uh, yeah. And so, he, you know, he, he called me in, into his office and it just so happens I mean, we're in Vancouver. It's on Water Street. So our offices happens to be like maybe blocks away from each other. And, and, and his name is James Smith from Lavard and Weinstein. If you're ever looking for a startup lawyer in Canada, the guy is amazing. And he doesn't pay me to say this. So he's just, <laughs> and in regards, he called me up and he's like coming to the office. And if you know James, he's a pretty relaxed guy. He's just easy breezy. And that's what really attracted me to him is that genuine and authentic nature that, that is what he is. So he came in and, and uh, he's like, come in which he never calls me in which first and foremost because we'll go for lunch and then second of all mm -hmm. he had his, his his partner uh randy you know this harvard lawyer uh come in into their boardroom which i've never seen their boardroom in my life um you know so i was like okay so he comes inside and he just you know breaks it down he's like okay I just want to prepare you on what's going to end up happening uh you're going to get sued and i and i was like you know what 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 do you mean like what what's happening do i not know something you know like i instantly i was a little bit taken back um i, I you know i shed modesty I, I would consider myself to be you know genuinely authentic and, and and honorable in terms of how i do business and really think about real long-term relationships and long-run people and so uh, I was like, no, nah, it's like, what's going to end up happening? They, what I learned, which I didn't know, and we're perhaps I, you know, I, well, not perhaps I was naive to it is, is that once you start getting into that spectrum, there's a, a, lot, a ton of competing interests that come into play, uh, which is, which was definitely something that was new. So competing interests would end up coming in terms of like, okay, there's a lot of people, um, inside this pool who have, uh, effectively an interest within the company. So if you have your VCs, they have an interest that effectively uh, is beneficial towards uh, their LPs or their business model, which is fair. You end up having, you know, the, the angels, you end up having uh, different employees and they all have a vantage point uh, and your potential acquire as well. Uh, they have, in, you know, your job is to really protect it. And inside that it's past employees or somebody else around there that can sue you or wants to sue you. And, mm -hmm. and we end up having somebody could do a frivolous claim and, and lawsuit against us. So, you know, it did come through 
and I remember it was for a couple hundred thousand dollars, which was which was absolutely uh, bonkers. And uh, I mean, we obviously it worked out in our favor. We didn't we didn't we didn't have to 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 settle or anything like that. We we, we walked through it all, but it was definitely an eye opening experience. Um, and again. One, yeah. thank you. If James, you're watching this, thank you for having that, that, that <laughs> to really kind of give these founder knowledge because it was something that was definitely not uh, something I was aware of. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that story. I, uh, I'm sure with an acquisition of any nature, there's a lot of conflicting objectives from different parties that you got to manage and finesse. And uh, it's part of the job, right? In many ways, especially going through that towards the end. Well, and, and in this case, what, what ended up happening was a little bit different is, is that the, it, was, it was unique in the sense that the company was going public in a month after inquiring us. So it was a, mm. effectively like a blackout period. So it was very, it, we had to be extremely careful in terms of how, especially I communicated or what was being communicated out. I see. Uh, and so what ended up happening is like their, their comms team uh, actually sat me down, sat our team down and, you know, gave us sort of like a sort of a fence post in terms of what we can communicate out, what we can, uh, right down to the simple fact that we weren't even allowed to do a lot of press on the acquisition. And it was this really weird, weird opportunity, like where we couldn't, well, we were sort of bounded to how we could communicate, even with our initial investors that have been with us forever, uh, because we knew what was happening and what was coming up and so it's this u unique unique aspect i mean that that piece was just unique to its own but uh it's it's definitely a learning experience throughout that whole entire process of all, all these different factors that you don't even really think about uh when you're when you're building up your company no i, I, I can't imagine um uh well as a founder i mean we're, we're both founders co-founders of, of different companies um you know our, our life is challenging we have a lot of good days a lot of bad days more bad days you know it depends in certain situations but we kind of get punched a lot we get knocked down and you know we have to pick ourselves up right um wanted to get your kind of perspective around the philosophy of like the killing it mentality you know you're like in round 14 and you know you know yeah, i'm not going down and you 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 persevere and you keep going i wanted to um see what your thoughts are on that yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I talk a lot about this, and more specifically, I love talking about um, and narrowing it down to the founder psychology. Uh, and so we are definitely in in a world. I mean, it's a zero sum game. And what I mean by that is, when you start getting into sort of like the the venture math, and in terms of what we're building for, in terms of building the billion dollar enterprise, it's kind of like hit a home run or not, sort of speak. You know, mm -hmm. like that's what it is. It's really not sort of like this lifestyle. You know, we're going to pass this on from generation to generation to generation and really grow up this this enterprise. It's like, okay, create as much enterprise value as we possibly can. Along there, there's a lot of signaling that happens in our business, uh, you know, signaling through press, signaling through whatever the case be. But often, I mean, it's all predicated on killing it, man. We're killing it. How you doing? We're killing it, culture. Uh, and, and that is, a, you know, to me, a, like, and I usually tell people this is like, you know, uh, there's nothing sexy about our business. Um, it is, you know, there is nothing. It's it's, it's startups are are it's a it's it's like getting punched in the face every single day. And I don't like to romance that part. Like you know, like, I don't like to romance in the fact that you know it's like ah, oh, it's like grit and hard, and you know, you got to hustle, hustle, hustle. I mean, yeah, you definitely got to go out there and work hard, and you're gonna, and and it's definitely a different um, experience than probably your normal nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, but what ends up happening is I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit and break this down into tenure as you know, when I was younger and more specifically to myself, I, you know, I really romance the fact like, Oh yeah, man, we're up 24 hours a day. We're going to be killing it. We're going to be like arms. Like we're just like live, eat and breathe in the office. That's what ends up happening. Um, what ends up happening through that whole entire process is that when you realize, and I, I feel like if you're successful in building your enterprise, tomorrow's problems are bigger than today's problems. And so you're always creating more headache. Uh, and if you're not equipped, which I was not through that whole entire process, these ups and downs and these emotional roller coasters are, are, are damaging for lack of a better word. Um, and they go from, you know, if you're normal school, anything else that you've gone through, it's been really structured. It's been, you know, sort of like 
you know, predicated in terms of, okay, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. This world is like being in this roller coaster and that proverbial putting your parachute, jumping out of a plane, but you have your ups and downs and they can happen from hour to hour. As, as we end up coming through, and this is what ends up happening is, is that it ends up playing on your psychology, it ends up playing on your mental health, physical, uh, your physical health, and you know, basically your emotional uh, relationships and your emotional health as well. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening with that is as we go on and we move through and you get more mature, you realize like the highs aren't as high and the lows aren't so as low and you, you really get tenured in terms of like really trying to stay consistent in the middle. And there's a lot of processes that we need to do in terms of really going out there to, to really fine tuning our tool, which is ourself. It doesn't help that often our, our, our industry is romanced by the killing culture. Our industry is romanced by the big money and the stories about the billion dollar exits. And it doesn't help the fact that we always talk about the big raises and all the awesomeness. Um, you know, and, and obviously, and I'm not trying to be negative, but a bit, you know, like pragmatically, startups are built to fail. And, and that's the reality of it. But often 99% of the time, we're listening about the romance of the story. So that is, is a little bit about the ups and downs and sort of the psychology and ideology and, and my thoughts around the killing it culture. No, it's, it's, it's so true. And you're right. Not a lot of people talk about it. And it is, in many ways, you see entrepreneurs, they have these great successes or big raises. And then you start kind of like thinking, okay, I want that. You know, I'm going to work harder to get it. But it sometimes could, it, it's never enough. You know, you always want more. But um, what would you say to founders who are starting off and, you know, maybe they got like a new high, they, they hit something that they're really proud of and um, they got the momentum, um, but then it dips again, you know, they, they're hitting a low again. Um, and this kind of ties into the whole mental health part of it, of being a founder or CEO of a startup. What would you recommend to them on how they could better manage these fluctuations what kind of tips or suggestions would you uh want to want to share yeah uh, okay and I mean, i'll predicate this in the back and again i'm going to go on the early tenures when i first started um i wasn't good at it i was awful at it uh it was uh, to a point where you know we'd have these great highs but then all of a sudden we'd end up these lows so i'd i'd, I'd come have panic attacks i would have sleepless nights often sometimes cry um, to hives, skin displacements, you know, it was just like the, like your body going through these ultimate stresses. And, and, um, and when you start talking to more founders, you realize, oh yeah, they've gone through that as well. But I mean, it's a very lonely space because what ends up happening is that there is really nobody to talk to, you, you, you know, because the killing it culture, you, you, you're generally not talking to your team about it because you're that fearless leader that's going out there and, and, and exactly. fighting the dude north and, you know, and talking about like, you know, the biggest cheerleader of the team, uh, your investors are like, yeah, man, this is what we are. And you're creating that excitement, which is fan and fantastic. I mean, you, you know, most founders have that, that drive in order to do that. And that's what makes them a little bit special and a little bit crazy at the same, I don't know, 60, 40, um, special DNA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in any regards, what, 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 ha- what at the beginning and the point that I'm trying to make it is, is that I was awful at it and it was, it was, it was absolutely uh, painful. It is even thinking about it right now gets me almost teared up about how ill-equipped I was. And I, I mean, I'm an educated guy, you know, like, you know, and gone through some school and all the other stuff and all that other jazz and but was not nearly equipped in order to go out there and get through this this thing so as i've gone through first and foremost is what i love to do and this is part of it is is and, and thank you for this opportunity is really having these conversations because there's nobody talking about this there's nobody other founders saying hey man you know i had this this and this happened and these are the feelings that happened so i at the beginning i felt like am i the only one that is feeling like i'm don't know what the yeah. fuck I'm doing and I'm lost and why am I crying? I never cry for business. You know what I mean? <laughs> why is panic attacks happening? Um, so I want to number one is, 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 is talk to, is talk about it. And, and who can you talk about it? It's not lost on me. You can't talk about it. So here's what I like to recommend and what I encourage is that 
you, you know, we always hear about the advisors and mentors, uh, which I love. And I, there's, I couldn't do it without advisors and mentors. But the thing that I really, really, really encouraging is a coach. Okay. Right? And the most professional actors have acting coaches on set. The, the tennis players have their coaches. Everybody has a coach. And these coaches are not advisors, they're mentors. They're actually people that are coaching you. The people that you can you can communicate, you can run through these through because um, oftentimes, sometimes we're chasing ghosts, or sometimes we need that, and we can't talk to our partners about it, our co-founders about it. We can't talk to you know who's that person that's going to actually be there through that tenure to understand exactly you know where you know where where our barometer is. Um, and so, what I'm what I my message to people is is number one is is communicate it, understand it, uh, understand that this is normal, and these are things that happen. Um, understand as you go through this process and you get more equipped with it, the highs aren't as high and the lows aren't as low. And then thirdly, and pragmatically, if there's a takeaway and something that you could, you know, a founder could do is, and I really like to distill this down in terms of like an actual tangible takeaway, is if you have an ESOP, an employee stop auction plan, and you have carved out, you may even want to carve out a portion of that for a coach in order to go out there and have that person have a vested interest in your success um, hmm. because that's somebody who's going out there and really looking out for you and making sure that you can have that fulfillment. And, and great coaches aren't folks that are giving you advices. They are, you know, they're, they're helping you find out you know, what, what's the next pain point? Where are you? What are something actionable? And what are ways and way forward that we can move towards? Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. No, it's great. Thanks, Jay. I, I can relate. I, I had a I had a coach for uh, almost a year, um, mm -hmm. personal coach, and then I became a business coach. Um, uh, you know, that person really helped me during that period of time to figure out how to run the business priorities and things like that. <clears throat> for me, also like having because I, I you know I'm married. I have I have three kids, and if it wasn't for my wife to support me also as like a backbone, I don't think I'd be here today right so um let's talk about that let's talk about work-life balance um you know i'm i struggle at times to make it work with my wife and you know being there for my kids like i feel like sometimes i'm just like an afterthought i'm there on the weekends or whatever you know spending time with them i'm trying to improve that process but work-life balance do you think this is like real concept for a startup founder and how how would you recommend you know founders going in as the first time into the startup who have families or starting families? Yeah. Um, amazing question. I mean, I think it actually, I don't think I know for a fact that I would not, or we would not have the success that we end up having without having my wife being so supportive, empathetic, um, and really going out there and, and carrying a lot of load when I couldn't be there because I was carrying and swinging for the fences. So I would, uh, her name's Nicole, Nicole Parmar. Um, and so if Nick, you're ever watching this, thank you very much. Uh, I do tell her often. Uh, about <laughs> so, so she's been, you know, having a partner that can really understand exactly what you're doing and it's not keeping score. That's the first and foremost, the thing that beautiful thing about uh, my partner and I is that she wasn't keeping score about what we're doing. Um, and, and, if, and so there was not tit for tat for us for to speak. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a little bit somewhat selfish in some aspect on my part where I wanted to go out there and swing for the fence and chase my goal mm -hmm. um, with, again, in a zero-sum game, knowing very well that this could potentially blow up and there could be nothing about it, uh, you know, and really making this investment and at the same time sacrificing opportunities for time with my children or her uh, yeah. and so now going back to your your question you know is there work-life balance uh, i you know i'm not a i haven't experienced work-life balance uh in terms of like some type of formulaic system I, <laughs> I you know so what i have found and what i've learned and what i am still learning is this is that um I, you know, I'm, and I, I mentioned to you before is I'm originally born and raised in Saskatchewan and we have harvest time and during harvest time, everybody's in the field and working long hours and, you know, uh, taking the crop off the field. And that time is like, you know, you're, you're full on and you're working. Yeah? And so, you know, it might be 
20 hours and then you sleep in startups. That is the case in businesses. That is the case. There's going to be moments where it's just like all hands on deck up and, and we move. Um, I think the balance comes into the part is, is neglect is, is what do we go out there? And I oftentimes I feel like that there's, if, for lack of better words, if there's buckets and are we not investing the time back into, um, our, our family, are we not investing the time into ourselves and are we not investing our time into our community and our friends? So I feel like what ends up happening is, is that, you know, if there's going to be harvest time on this area, when it's not harvest time, are we going back and refilling this bucket, uh, and putting it inside here? Now, here's the thing where I think I maybe flirt is I've learned to go out there and the biggest set, the, one of the biggest things that I was very, very, very guilty of is neglecting myself, my physical health, my mental health, and really taking the time for myself because I'd always work, always work. Then go to the family and be chasing. And I'd be like, there's not, I'm not taking me time. Problem with that is, you know, I gained a lot of weight. Uh, I was very unhealthy. Uh, and if I'm not be going at 110%, then all of a sudden my capacity be at 50% is 50% output on everything else that I'm touching. Okay. So that really came into uh, the way I think about balance is making sure that I'm investing the time when I can in the most appropriate channels that are most important to me, knowing that there's not going to be a quality, but we try to be as equitable as we possibly can. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's difficult. You know, you have compromises and, you know, sacrifices that we we make or you know as 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 owners of companies and things like that um when it comes to time like you know it's in my opinion it's the most sacred resource that we have it's not money or anything like that it's time you there's only 24 hours in a day right so there's only so much you could do um and it's hard as a founder or as a startup you know um to figure out okay how do i manage my time better or how can I, you know, get more time to what I need to do in your journey or in your kind of growth to date with the knowledge that you have now as an entrepreneur, uh, what, what did you do around when you, you know, had that feeling sink in is like, okay, I, I, I can't buy time. I, I can't get it. I can't get more. I have to optimize my day. I have to plan, it, you know, efficiencies and things like that. Was there like even like maybe a, a thing that hit you really hard at one point where like, okay, like I need to make a change or I need to do something. And, and what was it? Oh man. Yeah, I love this. Uh, you know, first of all, you can't buy time. I'm not sure if everybody understands or buys into that ideology um, or value statement to me. I absolutely do buy into that value statement is that you can't buy time. Uh, that is Again, something that really did, wasn't a, a, a real big learning for me until a little bit later into my career. But for myself, uh, after all said and done, there is this, uh, you know, had an opportunity to sort of sit back and, and spend time with my family. Here are the learnings that I got out of it that I sat back. It was, and it sounds sort of meta a little bit, but, I, I'm, you know, COVID was going on. I'm sitting in my living room. I'm with my family and I'm like, who am I? What do I want to do? There's a lot of opportunity coming in. Do I really want to jump in for the sake of jumping into something? And I'm sitting there with my family and realizing, wait a second, you know that bucket of investing in my family and that I, I wasn't afforded or did a good enough job of really coming into that. And I don't want to sacrifice that time anymore or mm -hmm. that opportunity uh, because I can't buy time. So, at the, so that was one aspect is really sitting back and realizing who do I want to be is I, I want to be the best husband, best dad that I possibly can be because there's an infinite amount of time that my son is going to think I'm cool. And he's seven years old now and I'm coming to maybe about five more years until dad's not cool anymore. So I was <laughs> like, let's take this time um, and, and spend that. And I say that in tongue, tongue in cheek. Um, and so I, you know, I'm starting to, you know, at the same time I have, I, I need a, a sense of purpose. I need a sense of fulfillment in terms of business and I want to do that. And so, um, I, my wife runs a, she's a, a beautiful, you know, 40 under 40 performance marketer, extremely successful. And I'm sitting there and I, I was like, I want to rock a product with you. 
you know, a CPG, D to C product that allows us to go out there and create a distributed team. So what we can do is we can have perhaps the best of all worlds. One is we can get the fulfillment of business. Two is we get to work together. And three is we get to travel and experience, you know, the world together. And that's time together. And to me, that really has become the biggest value consideration in terms of what's there um, in my life. Now, is that, 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 that experience? Because money can't buy time. So since you started talking about it, can you tell us a bit more about your new business? I think, yeah, some, it's I think uh, you call it the world's sexiest tongue scraper. So. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got it right here, actually. <laughs> um, all right, so here's here's what I'll give, give you the real quick Reader's Digest version. As I was sitting, and as I mentioned, I'm sitting at home. Um, my wife's a performance marker. She uh, makes she helps make other people millions and millions of dollars. I'm sitting there. I'm an Indo Canadian. Um, and so maybe a lot of Indian people uh, may may resonate with this, but as we are growing up, we we end up here's I have this we end up having these little tongue scrapers around our house. So it's just a, a piece of you know tin almost, and we'd scrape our tongue. And most people don't know this that their tongue is covered with with gunk. It's disgusting. There's a layer of filth that's on bacteria. Your yeah. yeah, and when you scrape it off, it's like a quarter of a teaspoon on there, and it sounds weird, but I love to talk. And I love tongue scraping. I do it twice a day. And I got all my hockey teams on it. My friends know about it. I got them all tongue scraping. I'm just like, only if you knew that there's this much disgustingness on your body, you take it off and they've all do it. But, so as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I want to talk to her. I'm like, I want to build the world's sexiest tongue scraper. And, <laughs> you know? and so she looked at me and she's like, you know, so, and then and the pitch to her um was i mean it's 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 something that i've been doing for two decades it's i love the cpg market right now it's it's light and so what we did do is we tested it out on a rendering on a website this is where a little bit of experience comes in we started selling them and doing a small batch test and then we had to refund everyone's money because we didn't have the product but i am glad to let you know that you know and i have it right here we have the world's sexiest tongue scraper made out of an alloy a metal oh. and it actually takes your 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 the, the gunk off your tongue it's coming out soon um and it's called gunky so that's that's the next stage of my life well i want to i want to get one because i actually do have a tongue scraper um my wife says i have bad breath uh, in the <laughs> evening when i when i get home and it's i think it's from all the talking i do all day and so like, yeah. it's just inherent right but I, I do agree it, it is there is a lot of crap on your people's tongues that people don't know about that leads to so many things bad breath and things like that so yeah I, i'd love to get one whenever whenever it's uh, whenever I, it's successful I, i'll get you the world's sexiest one please please so uh, uh, number one yeah <laughs> um thanks thanks for sharing that um i wanted to ask and talk about something that you brought up before uh about uh uncomfortable uncomfortability mm -hmm. is my new comfortability yeah. What does that, what, what does that mean? Huh, uh, you know, I, when I was, again, born in Saskatchewan, was there, did some great business out there. You know, some magazines would list us as the top 10 people to know and do business with in Saskatchewan. Uh, and then I moved to uh, San Francisco. Moved to San Francisco, realized we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, you know, and, I, and I equate this to being, you know, I'm, we're in Canada right now, and I'm a Canadian, uh, and hockey is really prevalent and big here. But imagine you being the best hockey player in Guatemala, and then you come up to Canada and you realize the kids on the street are better than you at playing hockey. That's what it was when I went down there. It's like, you know, thinking I was like I'm this beautiful hockey player, come down there, and all of a sudden it's just like, holy macros, am I out of my depth here? That was an absolutely uncomfortable stretch me out of my comfort zone in my safe area looking back at it now that's exactly where i learned and grew and was excelled and it took me a while and that's where the panic attacks and all that other stuff potentially started to come because i wasn't familiar mm -hmm. with it i was uncomfortable with that um that false sense of security or control perhaps as 
as I was able to go out there and look back and run through an iterative process, realizing that that is exactly where, you know, movement happened, where, where our winds started to come when we were outside of there. Mm-hmm. And there's this shift a maturity that ends up coming in that tenure where that uncomfortability, which was so uncomfortable at the beginning, now is my comfortable zone because I know I am not growing and I'm not moving or excelling if I'm not in that spot. The moment I get comfortable, I'm like, oh boy, this is, this is and also really, you know, and what ends up happening throughout the whole entire process, it, it, that relationship with, with, and the fear of failure has been re, you know, has, has, I have a different relationship with fear and failure. I look at failure as a data point. It's a necessary stepping stone to success. And I embrace it. Wow. Yeah. And I don't, it's, it's not, you know, like romancing it. It's just like, you want to do it cheap. You want to do it, you know, fast. And you want to go through this iterative process. Again, those aren't things that want, wasn't, I didn't, number one, appreciate, understand, um, or know. And so that uncomfortability taking encompassing all that, you know, the failure to failure, understanding that process, et cetera, et cetera, we talked about has now is my comfort zone. And if I'm not in that zone and it's not there pushing myself onto it, like a tongue scraper of all things, like, you know, I, I should be doing something more in the tech space. And when I went into this space is because, yeah, I want to learn. I want to go out there and try the CPG market to the D to C. I want to go out there and, and understand exactly what I don't know that I don't know to get into it. Um, and so that's where I feel like um, the biggest growth, the basic success and the biggest learnings come from. No, I, 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 I agree. That's why I like working when, you know, advising different companies because I get to get out of my sweet spot which I'm comfortable in now. And uh, the only way you could do it is by, is by putting yourself out there and trying something new and you fail, you learn, but it's the only way to move forward. Right. So no, I, I totally, I, I think that's a great point. Um, on that note though, um, I want to talk about, you know, the concept of fundraising and getting money. Uh, it's my last, probably last few questions I have here, Jay. Um, you know, for a lot of people, we talked about it a little bit before that, you know, going, raising money, it's, it's a stamp of approval. Uh, and that stamp of approval gives you the confidence to know that, hey, I made it kind of thing, right? Um, but in my eyes, I don't know, maybe other people's eyes, maybe you can uh, relate to this. I, if you need to go and raise money, I mean, maybe you're not running your business maybe effectively or maybe you need it for certain purposes but it's not a definition of success um what do you think's wrong with this thinking in general or like is it like a stigma in the industry that this is like what it takes to make or break it these days oh, okay so i mean a big wide open question i mean for me um and I'm, we're going to peel it in terms of the thought process here, but like four metrics that I love is cost of acquisition, lifetime value, churn, average revenue per user is really distilling it down to unit economic at the end of the day. And the best way to go out there for me to go out there and raise money is for my customer. You now value consideration, input out, input, value, there's a value where there's profit. Let's do it that way. Raising money for me is a function in order to get to that, to that step. Right? So again, is really distilling down, that, that piece and creating in, in, in startups is, you know, using it to create enterprise value um, and, and, and uh, excel the valuation of your company, right? So if money is used in a utilitarian way to create that enterprise value to go out there and, and pour more gas on the fire, fantastic. Bob's your uncle. I get it. I love it. Go. Understand. Um, you know, and then distilling that down and backing that up a little bit, there's like, there's three rules of startup that I kind of live by is don't run out of money, don't run out of money, don't run out of money. Uh, you know, and so, <laughs> I so love that. That's yeah, cool. so you, you need money. Now at the beginning, especially if you're going to be on, you know, let's say you're, you're in, at the different stages and we all know that there's different stages, but let's say like we're at the, you know, the, the beginning in terms of the life cycle and we're pre market product market fit, how we have a hypothesis and we, have, we think that we have a clean line to at least a site line to product market fit. So we, it's explorative. 
Um, we need to go out there and our product is destructive and distinctive what we think. We need to go out there and put a team together that can execute. Our market is, is you know, X amount of size. So we know that it is, and that's important to know because if there's venture math, if it has to be at a certain size, because it would work for venture capitalists versus non market cap that would work not for, and it might be like for smaller funds or angels. Um, and then, in, you know, there's pre-traction. So in order to really kind of get that um, piece, you, we need capital, we need oxygen, we need to go out there and swing for that fences. Now, raising money for the sake of raising money in the sense of really going out there and then getting it on TechCrunch or whatever the case be, that is absolutely wonderful if it's thought about in a utilitarian way in terms of how I think I've just mentioned it. It's like, we're going to go out there and gr grab talent. We're going to go out there and define a, a sight line in terms of here's where we want to go. We were going to go out there and leverage the fact that we can create buzz and signaling to bring and attract great talent into play. Um, we're going to go out there and, you know, understand our, our you know, our, our, our model so that we can put gas on the fire so that we can create more enterprise value. What I think happens and which is dangerous is, you know, the killing it culture is what I will call it is when we raise that $5 million and it feels like that's the win. To me, that is anything but the win. That is like a great data point. And I think it needs to be celebrated for 4.5 seconds, but we need to leverage that in order for us to go out there and create the value into the company so that we can go out there and create more revenue through customers or create a system where we understand our cost of acquisition, lifetime value churn, and average revenue per user. Um, and so often when I see the celebration of just the money that has been raised, yeah. I sometimes wonder if our priorities in or if our realization of what it really takes, because that to me is when the work really starts. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Um, a lot of other CEOs I spoke to that said that their life becomes hellish <laughs> once they once they raise that money because they got tons of people to report to a new board, new investors. And uh, it's scary, right? Because you're taking other people's money and you gotta you gotta, you know, make it work and get some sort of return. So gotta execute. Uh, you gotta execute. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You, you gotta execute. It's definitely um, yeah. Cool. Um, last, last question. Um, what would be, and I always like asking this because I always curious to know what everybody's going to say. Uh, what would be your advice to a 30 year old self? Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's always a ponder. For yeah. It, 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 uh, <laughs> The question that I have to a 30 year old self. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think I did it and was, was to invest in myself is to continually invest and learn, um, and, and, and strive to become a lifelong learner. Um, in, in that piece, the, the next thing I would go out there and invest in myself is, is uh, now is a good opportunity to go out there and swing for a business. Uh, the reason being is as your kids get older and you start having these opportunities, it, it, there's going to be more uh, dependencies um, in terms of your disposable income and other aspects of your disposable time that are going to, to lean and that time that you think is always going to be there and that commodity of time is, is flighty. Uh, and so with one kid, then two kids, and then so on and so forth, it becomes uh, a lot harder. So, uh, so my advice would be is, uh, continually, continually uh, learn and push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, and then and the second one is uh, the time that you have right now. Um, it is, it, you, know, you know, explore it and invest in yourself and start a business. Um, and those are the things I did do. So uh, nice. I, would, I would give myself my, that's, that's, but I don't think I appreciated 
um, the time as much as I do now. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. The wiser, the wiser you get, the more wisdom you have, and um, you realize what all the things you could have done differently, right? It just comes down to experience, I think, at the end of the day, with everybody. Yeah, yeah. No, I would, I definitely agree with that. Also, I mean, as I look back, um, you know, they, I, I try to figure out how I become the better version of myself. And I look back and I think, oh, there's so many naiveties and things that I could have done a lot differently. So, uh, but it's all the journey of what makes us who we are today. Nice, nice. Well, Jay, it was awesome having you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, for everyone who's going to be listening, uh, this was another off the record episode. Uh, it's a podcast with the goal to build a community of founders and VCs to talk about how to help each other make businesses better. So thanks again uh, for listening and I'll stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. My pleasure.